Check one, two. Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. And welcome to my podcast. Wanted to congratulate everybody for having an outstanding weekend. I certainly did. I enjoyed myself. I spent the entire weekend working on how I can help other people become successful. So we were up until wee hours of the morning speaking to our developers and our programmers about good things that are going to be coming down the pike so you guys can learn and enjoy and have a laugh as well. Today we have podcast number 176. It is five questions that were sent in by real estate investors. And remember, if you have a question, send it to support at michaelquarles.com. One more time. Support at michaelquarles.com. And for those of you that may not know how to spell quarrels, it is Q-U-A-R-L like Larry, E as in Edward, and S as in Sam. Q-U-A-R-L-E-S. Let's get into these questions. I'm going to try my best. So question number one. If I have a realtor out knocking on doors and bringing me deals, what would your compensation plan be for this agent? Specifically, if our hotel fee will be 15,000 after expenses. Keep in mind, if you have a realtor, that realtor is most likely an agent, if not a broker. Makes it a little bit easier if they're a broker, but if they are an agent, the amount of money you pay them is dependent upon what their broker arrangement is with them. So don't get anybody in trouble. If you have a bird dog who is an agent and you happen to be a broker, realize that you have to pay that agent's broker. If you're a broker and that person isn't an agent, keep in mind that you may in fact be violating your broker's license requirement in that if you pay for a lead that and your condition on paying for that lead is if something positive happens for you, then that lead cost or that expense is going to be referred to as a commission. So the Department of Real Estate looks at that and says, well, you're you're paying an unlicensed person. The way to get around that, if they're getting around, seems like we're trying to circumvent it. I don't mean it that way. However, the way, the way it should be done is pay them a, a fee to their broker. If you don't want to do that, you have to then pay them, or even if they're not a, an agent or broker, for all leads, irrespective of the outcome of those leads. So whether or not they produce or not, just much like a lead selling company over the internet. The bigger question is, is how much do we pay this agent If we're going to do everything legal, how much do we pay them to knock on doors, find us opportunity? Well, personally, I've only bought in one house through the multiple listing service. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there that say find houses in the multiple listing service. The reason I don't like finding houses in the multiple listing services because I know there's a, a, a fee attached to the marketing of that house. They call it commission, and sometimes that commission is 6%, sometimes it's 5 sometimes it's 7 I don't want to pay that 6% in, in marketing costs. I'd rather spend my marketing dollar and find the deal directly. Getting back to... 
how do we compensate this person? What amount should we compensate them at? I think we have to be very cognizant of not breaking any rules that have been outlined for us and guidelines that have been set for us to follow. I think one way we can do that is to, assuming that we have a corporation, make that party an officer of that corporation, a vice president. You'll notice there's a lot of vice presidents of corporations and give that person the ability to negotiate on behalf of the corporation. Corporation is then the one uh, buying the property. So they're basically buying a house for themselves. If you want to look at it from the bigger, wider picture or viewpoint. And then in that case, you can create an opportunity based upon performance. This is absolutely a conversation for an attorney. And I would have that. I know how I do it, but I would hate to have someone in Wyoming do it the way I do it because I do it the way I do it, of course, all across the country, but I, I'm in California, so I've had my California attorneys review my business model to make sure that I was within the guidelines, and California's guidelines are pretty stiff. So at the end of the day, if you have an agent that's working for a broker and you want to pay that agent, it's the agent and brokers, whatever their, whatever their condition is. All agents will have a, an agreement uh, to which they must follow that outlines their commission structure and what they can charge you and what they can't charge you and set that with their broker. And you just, you're, that's your guideline, which is why I started off the conversation saying that if it were a broker and not just an agent that it might be a little bit easier because a broker can do anything the broker wants to do. In fact, the broker could work for free if they choose to work for free. So if you found a broker to go door knock for you, someone with a broker's license, and quite frankly, it doesn't take a, a bunch to become a broker, that may be what you want to look for as a broker and not an agent. Bottom line, I'm torn here because I know the reality of an agent is, is they on a listing side, they want to make 3% and on the selling side, they want to make 3% as well. If you're not going to use them for the selling side, somebody else is going to be used for the selling side, then I would say that if they found you a house and a seller that was willing to sell and you can mitigate and the cost of that marketing by a lower cost and it wasn't more than 10 percent of the profit in the deal so if you were going to make 40 grand that the three percent that you were going to pay your real estate agent or broker didn't exceed you know four thousand dollars ten percent of the 40 grand then you know whatever you want to do yeah pay them three percent i think that's reasonable sometimes it becomes unreasonable, but at that point it would be reasonable. And they may want to do some of the work for you once you have it under contract. I probably would not request them to do that. I know how to manage a real estate transaction and I have staff members to do that for me. But I think the question is really, you have a bird dog out there that has a real estate license. How much, do you gonna, how much are you gonna pay them? You're going to pay them what their broker arrangement is with the contract that they've signed with their broker and what it outlines for that compensation. And you're going to be done at that point. So check with them. Don't do anything illegal. There's too many ways to do it correctly. Do it that way. Question number two. I noticed in a recent podcast, you mentioned that if someone brings you a deal, you would pay them a third of the profit. That's not what I said. Do you have a formula you used for referral realtor deals? That's absolutely not what I said. What I said was, if you have a deal, finding the deal is worth a third. I'm not saying someone else finds you the deal and it's worth a third to you. 
Finding the deal for yourself is worth a third because you have mechanisms in place. You have systems in place. Those systems cost you money. Someone else doesn't have those systems in place. It shouldn't cost them a third. But f you finding the deal costs a third. If you don't have the money to buy the deal and you have to JV the deal, bringing in your money guy is not worth more than half of what's left over. So a third for them. And then naturally you would keep the other third. So two thirds to you, a third for finding the deal, a third for doing the deal and the lender or the JV partner gets a third. Just understand that the third isn't just like I got lucky and I went out there and I found this house to buy and now I want to sell it for a third of the profit. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a business that's or a person that's in the investment business and their job, their, what they do in life is finding deals. They don't luck upon them. That's worth a third. Sometimes you'll spend less money. Sometimes you'll spend more money finding deals, but on average, yeah, it's worth a third. So go from with that number. I did not say at all, if someone brings me deals, please do not bring me deals. Okay, guys and gals, I have enough already. In fact, if you want some deals, we actually wholesale, yuck, one more time, yuck, 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 yuck. We absolutely wholesale some deals that we can't buy because I do not have enough money to buy all the deals we have available to buy. That seems crazy, but my Alex and Ryan system is so good, I can't buy all the deals. So I hate saying it, but that's the truth. So if you want, it, want some deals, you call up over there and you talk to Gabriel and um, he'll talk to you about our wholesale list. In fact, it's online. All you got to do is register for it. So you can register and actually see the list that's available to you. Question number three, when pulling a mailing list from list source, is it better to use an equity percentage or using an equity dollar amount? Also, do you ever set a minimum property value? I have started, uh, depending on, uh, uh, on what I want to accomplish, if I, want to if I want to buy the low end houses that will recoup my um, investment within 24 months, I'm not going to put an equity dollar. If it's my goal to buy not higher end properties, but properties that are more closer to the median value, then I'm going to put a 30% to 100% equity dollar and a $30,000 to the median value dollar. So uh, I'm always going to make sure that the property has a $30,000 equity spread. And it's always going to have at least 30% equity. So when you, multi when you, you can do the math on that, you can tell that in doing that, you in fact are placing a minimum property value. Of naturally of $30,000, but I'll, I'll buy a house hundred percent. And someone wants to give me a house that's worth 30,000. I'll buy it all day long. So now from a, do I put a minimum property value? No, I, I, I don't. Uh, I use those other, that other criteria to get rid of the really, the, you know, the $10,000 house. Although I like them every time I find one, I keep it. Because especially if it's rented, because I know I'm going to recapture my rental. I mean, my, my investment within two years, I've decided not to be crazy anymore and not to think so, so negatively about passive income. I think there are some negative passive income formulas out there, but, and I also believe my passive income formula is not negative. The one I like is I want to recapture again my money, the cost of the property, the entire cost of the property. I'm not talking to the cost of the monthly expenses of the property, like insurance and taxes and maintenance and vacancy. I'm talking about the cost of the property when I bought it, if it was $12,000 and the rent, if I got it 100% rented all the time in 24 months, it would pay off that $12,000. I'm going to buy that property and keep it. That's my, my passive income formula. So 
There are some people that say, well, I want $100 a door, $200 a door. I want a 2%. I want whatever it is. This, that's mine. Whatever it works for you, that's fine. Here's what I don't think you should do in the passive income arena. And I have no clue how I got here, but I apologize, guys. Here I am. I don't think you should buy property based upon tax advantage structure only. But there are a lot of people that do. Don't buy a property just because you need the tax write-off. It needs to be income producing as well. In fact, I have seen people that have bought property where without the tax advantage, it was a negative cash flow. So they fed the property more than it produced until they factored in their tax advantage. I do not think you should buy those properties. There's better properties out there to buy. Here's the thing. I don't know if any of you folks go to those speaking things where people get up on stage and they, they talk for a couple hours, get y'all excited. They turn down the air conditioning so it's cold. You got to huddle up and you got to you know, stay warm and you're listening. You're in tune with what they're saying. But they're selling you something they couldn't sell to somebody else in their own city. I actually saw it. I was on stage. I, I was going to speak for two hours about massive investing. And prior to me getting on stage, a salesperson, for lack of better words, flew to California. He flew from Texas to California to sell. And we were in, in uh, Huntington Beach, so it's a pretty nice area of California, you know, upscale kind of thing. He flew there trying to sell real estate to these guys and gals in California in Texas. Now, here's the deal. Here's the logic I couldn't get. If he can't sell it to Texans, why should we buy it? If he can stay home and convince his population base, because Texas is a pretty good-sized uh, state, I almost said country, uh, pretty good-sized state. If he can't sell it to Texans, why are we going to be silly enough to buy it? And here's why. Here's why people were buying them. Because they, they imagined they were, well, man, that must make money because you can't buy that fourplex in California for that value. So I'm going to just buy it because it just seems like it's a deal. No, don't do it that way. Go, what's it cost? What is my, what's my income? How long is it going to take me to get my investment back? Oh, never. I'll never get my investment back because I've got to feed it every month. Unless I write it off on my taxes. People, let's think a little bit harder. If you have a question, you're getting ready to buy an investment property, you're not sure if you should buy it, you send me an email. Send it to michael at michaelquarles.com and I'll try my best to give you an answer and, and guide you in the right direction. But do not buy a piece of property until you know, in fact, 100% it's the right deal for you. Question number four. Can you explain how to find a BPO agent in new markets you are working in? Oh my goodness, this was a tough one. Well, quite frankly, if you, there's two ways to do it. And I can't say either one of the ways is better than the other way. My systems part of me, you know, I'm a guy that just want to have systems and you follow those systems. And if the system does it, it does it and we're done. The other side of me, you know, my, my frugalness, yeah, I know, I drive a Bentley and I can say I'm frugal. I, I'd, I'd much rather spend money on things that are worth spending money on than money someplace else. So my frugalness gets involved. So here's the two ways. I use a company called Coaster. And I don't know if it's coaster.com or what have you, but it's a BPO company. That's what they do is they have agents they've signed up across the country who will go out and give you a BPO. The problem with coaster, quite frankly, is they charge you $150 per structure and they're slow. It's kind of like trying to pour syrup in the winter out of a you know, the pancake is just sitting there. You got the butter on top of the pancakes and the syrups. You got the syrup jug upside down and nothing's coming out. The pancakes are getting cold. The butter's running off the top, but you can't get the syrup out because it's so cold. That's what it's like sometimes. It takes that long. 
I've seen paint dryer faster than sometimes coaster has gotten me a BPO back. The other way of doing it, however, is you can call around. There's, there's companies like Century 21, Caldwell Banker, Prudential, Fred Sands, KW. There are companies that are national franchisees, Remaxes, that you can call them up and you can, because there's going to be an agent sitting at what we call the up desk, waiting for the phone to ring. You call that person up and you say, are you a BPO agent? Can you give me a BPO? They say, no. Call another one up. Are you a BPO agent? No. Are you one? No. Yes, I am. Great. I have a BPO to be done on this property. And what I'd like to have you do is set an appointment with the seller to go in and do a BPO. And when I buy it, I want to list it with you. And they may either hang up on you, say, great, thank you, or say, no, I don't do it that way. And until you find someone that says, yes, that would be great. I'll do that. Just keep calling. Now, there are some hints to finding these people rather than just calling the up desk at Century 21, call Will Bank or Prudential, Fred Sands, KW, Remax kind of thing. And that is most all boards in large metropolitan areas, boards of realtors, mo local multiple listing services are online. And most of the ones that I've seen that are online allow you to do a, a search based upon words. Some of those words and the keyword that I would want to do a search at. So if I go into Visalia, California, and I want to find an agent to do a BPO, I'm going to go to the Visalia Public Record Board. They have a private side and a public record side or public side. I'm going to type into their public side, show me houses that have REO attached to it. Those are real estate owned properties by a bank. Those are houses that went through foreclosure. The bank now owns them. I want to find the REO agent because the REO agent does a BPO for their lender prior to getting that listing. And I know they're trained to do that BPO because a BPO is much more strict and stringent of a task than a CMA, comparative market analysis. So I want to call that REO agent and see if they do private BPOs. If they do, I'm going to have them go out and give me one. Now they may charge me. I don't care. I paid Coaster up to 150 bucks. I'm just trying to get it done faster than Coaster does with their, their time frame some days and get it back to me. So again, two simple ways, call Coaster, let them do all the work. Be a little bit more frugal. Find someone on your own. Sometimes they won't charge you. Sometimes they will charge you. BPO agents are typically REO agents. And um, find your REO agent. The nice thing about, by the way, the nice thing about the REO agent is they're not just giving you a BPO. They also have the arsenal of contractors. And they understand the rehab part of real estate investing because most every foreclosure need something done to it because people aren't polite to houses. Few people are, you know, move out of a, a foreclosed house with love and care. They're frustrated and angry. And that's what it looks like when they move out. They just leave stuff all over the place. They damage things because it's no longer, they're not emotionally tied to the real estate anymore. They're not going to take care of it. And so those REO agents have those service providers and they're used to you know, getting prices and understanding valuation from a, a rehab perspective, which most agents don't understand. So dealing with an REO agent is great. Now, they're listing agents. They're not selling agents. So understand that they probably wouldn't be the one who will eventually sell your property. You know, their whole goal in life is to take listings, which is okay. That it's how you get houses on the multiple listing service. It's a fine thing. Hope that made sense. I know I'm getting long winded. Let's last question. Question number five. What are the most common objections you hear from sellers when negotiating a sub two purchase for wholetailing? No, don't want to, don't understand it. Other than that, yeah, but we just explain it to them. 
There's 17 objection handlers for subject to financing. There's only 17. Been doing this long enough. It's only 17. And I could go through them if you'd like. Not going to do it on today's call. But if someone wants to write in and say, hey, can Mike go through the top five questions, the top 10 questions, the top 17 objection handlers for subject to, I don't have time. I don't mind doing that on another podcast. The reality, though, is an objection only occurs when we haven't done our job. And hear me, let me clarify that for you. Someone can only ask me an objectable, uh, an objection or, or present an objection when I haven't already answered their question within my presentation. When I haven't already using NLP, using some tonality, using some embedded command, some positive and negative reinforcement, when I haven't already set them up to agree, then there's objections that I have to handle. And just understand that that's just, it's about what we didn't do correctly. Because one of the things we ask a seller, especially when we look at subject two, we ask them the subject two question, which is question number four on the inbound seller script, which is, let me tell you a little bit about how I buy houses. And you go through your spill and the one of the last sentences in that spill is, and what we're going to do is we're going to be responsible for the mortgage and subtract that and come up with a walkaway money. How much walkaway money would you like when will you sell your house to me today? The amount of money that you think is fair after we become responsible for that mortgage. Did I say that I was going to pay the mortgage off? No, I'm eventually going to pay it off, but I'm going to become responsible for it. That's the introduction of subject two. They, they could ask me, what do you mean by that? And I'm going to go into it and what I mean by that. I don't have an issue with explaining to them what subject two is. Most of the time they won't ask me that. But then my next conversation as I go out there, you do understand what subject two is, correct? And they may say yes, even if they say yes, I'm going to explain to them what subject two is because some people say they understand something just because they don't want to feel a little silly. And I don't want them to feel silly or unknowing and I certainly don't want to get all the way into escrow and then think, oh, well, I didn't realize that's what subject two meant. I want to be above board and let them know. So I'm going to start explaining just like I did over the phone when I asked you what amount of money you wanted to walk away with after we took care of the mortgage and became responsible for it what we intend to do and we go through the using objection handlers, present them with the reason to say yes to our subject too. But again, if someone or many of you want to know what the subject to objection handlers are, just, you know, write us and say, Hey, can Mike explain that on a podcast? I'd, I'd take the whole hour. It'd be a long one. I'll take a whole hour. I'll explain it. I don't have an issue with that at all. It's going to be a little hard to do it now because I've been on the on the, the podcast so long already. And um, gosh, yes, it's already been 30 minutes. Let's do a couple in-house announcements. Great 2016. The start of 2016. I want to commend you guys and gals out there. I want to appreciate what you have done for yourselves in the beginning of 2016 because I have noticed it at Yellow Letters. Some of you have set little goals, which is great. Goal setting is great. Some of you have set massive goals, which is awesome. I mean, it tickles me. And I just want to, some of you guys and gals, I just want to, I want to give you love because I can see you successfully doing what you want to do because you have, you, you, you just did it. You, you did, made the commitment. You're doing it. I just, I want to hug you guys. Th those of you who just decided that you're going to take 2016 and you're going to kill it and you're going to conquer it and you're never not going to have anything you want 
ever again. Man, you guys did excellent, excellent in the beginning of 2016. Let's keep it up. Let's not, oh, that was all exciting. I, you know, I, I went to the gym twice kind of concept. Let's keep it going. If you haven't started your marketing in 2016, get that platinum card, get that 15% discount, and let's start. Hit that mail, 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 mail. The other thing, and I think this is pretty cool. I have set up, for those of you who want me to hold you accountable, I have set up a way for you to go onto my michaelquarles.com site and sign up free of charge no cost to you none whatsoever free absolutely free a way for me to hold you accountable if you're like me A lot of you are, because I'm just normal. If you're like me, you need encouragement from time to time. You need to know what you do matters from time to time. You need to be reminded to do what you've set in place to be done from time to time. And if you want me to help you with that, I have set up a platform that I will do that on a daily basis. And it is absolutely free. I will help you be accountable to yourself, to the goals that you've set for 2016. And I'm going to do it in a way that is both polite and productive. So if you want to do that, you'll see it on michaelquarles.com. If you don't see it, can't find it, send email a support an email at support at michaelquarles.com and we'll guide you in the right direction. But again, I'm just going to hold you accountable. If you ask me to hold you accountable, if you tell me what your goals are going to be and you don't achieve them, if I ask you every day if you achieved your goals, eventually you're either ask, going to ask me to stop asking you or you're going to start achieving them. One of those two things. And, you know, really only one of those are better. The, you know, if you tell me to stop asking you because you haven't achieved something you want to achieve, well, well, shame on us. Because if I can't figure out a way for you to, to achieve what you want to achieve within the guidelines and the parameters that you can achieve them within, that's all I have, guys and gals. I appreciate you having the, the patience to put up with me for 35 or 6 minutes. And um, we'll talk soon. You have a wonderful day and go kill a house. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.